I was driving a shortcut from 29 Palms, California to Albuquerque, New Mexico. 29 Palms is located in the desolate high desert east of LA. The shortcut was all two lane roads through narrow nothingness, except for passing through Amboy, California. Amboy is a nearly abandoned town nearly as far below sea level as Death Valley, with a dormant volcano and a lava field on one side and a salt flat on the other. It was also at the time a hot spot for satanic group activity. So I was driving by myself in the afternoon. I stopped in Amboy and snapped a picture of the city sign just to prove I was there to a friend who had dared me to take that route to I-40. I got back in my car and proceeded to drive into the mountain range between Amboy and I-40. Once I reached the top, I am driving north through a canyon with a high grass on both sides of the road. Up ahead, I see some stuff in the middle of the road. As I approach, I slow down to see a red Pontiac Fiero stop sideways across both lanes. A suitcase, open with clothes, scattered everywhere and two bodies laying face down in the road. A man and a woman. I stop a hundred feet or so away and the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. Being a marine, I reach under the seat and pull out a 9mm pistol and chamber around. Something seemed very wrong. It looked too perfect, as if it were staged. An ambush? Was I being paranoid? Something was just wrong. Getting out of the car seemed unthinkable. It was a horror movie move. As I scanned the road, I saw a line I could drive. Past the guy in the road, on his left, swerved to the right side of the woman, behind the Fiero, and I'd be back on the other side. I dropped it into first gear, punched it, and drove the line I planned. I passed the back of the Fiero without hitting it, or either of the bodies in the road. I continued forward a couple hundred feet and slowed down so I could breathe and let my heart slow down. As I looked up into the rear view mirror, I saw that the two bodies had gotten up to their knees and 20 or so people emerged from the tall grass on either side of the road by the cars and body. At that moment, my right foot smashed the gas pedal to the floor and I did not let up until I had to slow down for the I-40 east on ramp. I will never know what would have happened to me had I gotten out of the car to check on those bodies or stopped my car closer to them. Somehow I do not think it would have been good. Sometimes real life can be scarier than a movie. About two years ago I was driving home from a family reunion pretty late at night. The drive was about two hours. I didn't stay the night because I had to be back for work the following day. Most of the drive was on roads with really dense bushes and trees on either side. The really creepy ones you see in a lot of movies. Anyway, I had been driving for about 45 minutes and I was starting to get really tired. You know how sometimes you just become suddenly really tired out of nowhere? Well yeah, that happened to me. I knew I wasn't going to last, but I didn't come across any place that I felt I could park and safely sleep. Anyway. After it became clear to me that I wasn't going to find a place to pull up, and my tiredness wasn't going away, I did something very questionable. I pulled over to the side of the road onto the grass behind some bushes to try and hide my car from anybody else who was coming past. I made a mental note that the time was 11.22 and then fell asleep. Sometime later, I was awoken by a scratching sound. I looked at the clock. 11.50. The sound stopped after a few seconds, and it was because I was still extremely tired. I didn't bother looking around and simply just went back to sleep. I was later awoken by the same sound, and it was now 12.40. This time it really freaked me out because the sound didn't stop. The thought ran across my mind that it was just an animal inspecting the car. But why would it return almost an hour later after it had already previously... I looked in my rearview mirror and just managed to catch a glimpse of something running away into the forest. Now at the time, I thought it was the damn hook killer. You know, the one that scratched that couple's car and then slaughtered the guy when he went out to investigate? Fuck that, I thought to myself. So I got the hell out of there. There was a bend no more than 100 yards up the road, and as I came around it, there was a fucking car parked off to the side of the road with the driver's door open. I slowed down just to look to see if anybody was in there. There wasn't. Then I looked in my rear view mirror. I didn't see anything. And then all of a sudden this guy comes sprinting around the corner. He starts screaming at me, shouting stuff like, Hey! 
Hey you, get the fuck out of your car, now. I noped the fuck out of there and sped off. Never saw the guy again. Moral of the story, don't fucking sleep on the side of the deserted road. It's actually been really hard getting around to tell this story. For a long time, reading true scary stories online or listening to them on YouTube, I often wondered why anyone would tell the story of something tragic that had happened to them that others would look at as entertainment. Finally, I decided to tell it, because I realized it's not just about entertainment, it's also a way of helping people who might find themselves in similar situations. My story took place about 10 years ago. My friend Jake and I grew up together. We were best friends for as long as I can remember. We sat by each other at school, we hung out during recess, we played video games together. We were very, very close. We even decided to go to the same college together. I thought Jake could have gotten into a much better school than me, but like me, he wanted us to have the experience together. When the time came for us to leave for college, we left a few days before we had to be there and made it into a road trip. We gave ourselves three days worth of driving to get there. And neither Jake nor I had ever driven that long of a distance before. So it was quite an adventure. We thought it would be cool to see some of the countryside before having to buckle down and study. The second day, we were driving through the mountains. It was a whole new experience too because I'd never done it. I think I felt sick a lot of the time and likely had to do with the elevation. However, towards the end of the day, something went wrong with the car. I was driving and suddenly seized up and I had trouble even getting it off the road. Jake and I couldn't really figure out what to do with the car. It was way beyond our expertise. We were also in a bad area as far as cell phone signals were concerned. We didn't know how far away we were from a gas station either. So we decided that one of us would hitchhike to a gas station and get some help. All of our belongings were in the car and the trailer to the car. So one of us had to stick with the car. Jake decided that he would be the one to go and find help. It took a while before a car picked him up. By that point, there wasn't much sunlight left, so I just sat in the driver's seat and waited. The sun went down, and a state trooper at one point pulled up to my car and I had a chat with him. I let him know what was going on and that my friend had hitchhiked a ride to try and get help. He took some information and said he would drive to the gas station to see if my friend had gotten there. Apparently, about 30 miles away, there was a gas station with a garage that could have towed our car for us. The officer then asked how long I'd been waiting, and I let him know at that point it had been well over three hours. This would have been enough time for the car with my friend to go to the gas station, get the tow truck, and be back three times over. When the officer left, I was concerned. And when the officer was gone a long time, I was more concerned. It was dark out, and for the first time I truly felt alone. It was an odd, unpleasant feeling, but I also sort of thought and felt that I didn't want the officer to come back because I somehow knew it would be bad news. It was nearly two hours later that the officer came back. He had the tow truck with him, and I was relieved. I was sure that Jake was with them. However, when the officer came back to my car, Jake wasn't with him. He informed me that no one had stopped at the gas station to get a tow. He also checked to see if anyone had seen the car with Jake in it and no one was able to pull it from memory. So the car was towed. And while it was being worked on, I had to go to the police station and file a report. They had to call Jake's parents and let him know he was missing. I got a motel room in the area. I put off the trip because I was worried about my friend. I spent four days in a motel, freaked out and worried I would never see my friend Jake again. Finally, the police came to talk to me. The car that Jake had gotten in a ride in was found in a grocery store parking lot. Jake was in the trunk, he was naked, beaten, bloody, and unconscious, but he was still alive. He was in a coma for about a month before he gained consciousness again, and even after that it was weeks before he was even able to recognize me or anyone even longer before he was able to recall what had happened. I don't want to go into much detail, but the people that had picked him up had stolen the car they were driving. They robbed him of his money, credit cards, and cell phone. It was actually due to the credit cards that they were even actually caught. There were two men, and one of them is still in jail. I didn't go to college that year, but I'm happy to tell you that the following autumn, Jake and I finally made it to college together. This time, however, we flew, and his parents came with us. 
We spent all four years roomed together and still are best friends to this day. Hitchhiking for any reason is a really bad idea. If Jake and I had waited, the officer would have eventually come upon us and my friend would have never had this happen.